We are here again at Jamestown Fort, and we have come back for a tour with Mark Summers. He is one of the tour guides here at Jamestown Fort, and he did an absolutely fabulous job on the first tour that we did with him. So when we found out he had another one, we came back. This will be his part two, which is early African history here at Jamestown Fort. Uh, we'll go see that now. We'll go ahead and begin uh, here, and then we'll begin walking to those benches, and we'll stay kind of in the shade in Newtown. So this is the only tour that goes that direction. And we're going to talk about Jamestown Chapter 2 here on the first African tour. So as I said earlier, every tour I write, I, I, uh, I like to do it personally. Uh, and I'm always changing my research, changing my mind based on new and better information. But the whole point of this tour originally was it was commissioned in 2017 by the park to correspond with an active archaeological dig that lasted for three years. So we are a private archaeological group that work from private land over there. Did have a three-year contract to work on National Park Service land, uh, looking for the William Pierce house, but our uh, interest was in Angela. So Angela was an enslaved woman from Africa, one of the first documented Africans in Virginia from 1619. Now of the 32 original Africans that first arrived at what is now Hampton, Virginia, nine of the 32 lived at Jamestown here, the capital. Eight of the nine Africans actually would have been working at um, uh, Governor Yardley's plantation or house where you parked your car today. Now, what makes that problematic is that that's a hard place to do archaeology. So what made Angela very important for the archaeology team was that she lived at the William Pierce household, which is land right here a few hundred yards to my left that we could dig on. Now, the whole point of the tour was to give a little bit of context to 1690. But the problem with anniversaries is anniversaries come and go. People make promises at anniversaries. And then the anniversary is over and people tend to go right back to what they were doing before the anniversary. 1619, unfortunately, was no different. And I think uh, when I started doing this tour and started doing it to other groups and organizations, uh, the tour grew because I think often what's missed in our discourse is that we talk about 1619 to 2019. But I want to talk about the development of race and slavery in what I call Chapter 2 or Chapter 3 of Jamestown. So we spent a whole lot of time in the 1630s, 40s, and 50s. This is the only tour that does so. So just to give you kind of a reminder of what chapter one of Jamestown is, it's kind of my way of saying, you know, that Jamestown has three sections to it. Chapter one is kind of the Jamestown Fort. That's what most people are familiar with. John Smith, Pocahontas. But you have to remember that when the English people got here in 1607 and encountered the Powhatan that were already here, remember that the purpose of Jamestown in 1607 was to be a business. And if we don't understand that, the rest of this tour won't make any sense. Jamestown was started by the Virginia Company of London, a private business corporation headquartered in London, send people over here to make money. Now there's a lot of struggle at Jamestown and for the first five years, quite frankly, there's no money to be made here. It was a failure. You know, we talked about the earlier day, the death, the disease, the bad leadership, the warfare, the idea that powers and people are gonna resist the English because this is their home, their home of them. But after five years, the English finally found a way to make money and it was from an obscure fellow named John Roth. John Rolfe is somebody who back in England was barely heard of. Most people hadn't heard of John Rolfe. He didn't come from a prominent family. Uh, we could argue he was a relative nobody when he got here to Virginia. He actually in 1609 was on a ship called the Sea Venture. That ship crash landed in Bermuda in 1609. It inspired the play The Tempest. And those uh, English people marooned in Bermuda for eight months, eventually got here to Jamestown in 1610 and missed the complete starving time. So it was actually a good thing that they crash landed in Bermuda. And John Rolfe was one of them. So what does this matter? Well, John Rolfe was in Bermuda, and Bermuda is a place where you can find Spanish tobacco. Now, I want you to keep in mind that English people were already addicted to Spanish tobacco since about 1580. Since about 1580, addicted to Spanish tobacco. See, there's already tobacco that grew in Virginia. It's called Rustica, Nicotium Rustica. Uh, it's very strong. Powhatan smoked it, English didn't like it, thought it was bitter, wasn't what they wanted. They themselves had been addicted to a Spanish strain of tobacco since 1580. Now you gotta, you can read in English writings, people like King James and others who are talking about how bad tobacco is for society and all these people are smoking and some kings and queens in Europe are saying it should be illegal and others are saying it should be legal. And they're making arguments eerily familiar today. You have one side of the coin saying this product is bad for society, it's dangerous. You have another half saying, well, people are gonna do it anyway, let's tax it and control it. But let us consider that tobacco is in fact a drug business, The nicotine is addictive and it is controversial, and it was so 400 years ago, and now the English are gonna start shipping it from here back to England? 
And I want you to keep in mind that in 1618, King James, who all this is named for, actually wrote a pamphlet saying tobacco is bad for your health. Said it was bad for society. Didn't have the uh, science to back it up, but he kind of knew. He equated coffee with, you know, smoking pipes. And the point is, King James said tobacco is bad for your health, but I want you to know he never did anything to stop the growth and transport sale of tobacco from here to England. You know why? Because the charter said he got 20% of all the money made at Jamestown. Something happens when you get 20% of the profit of something, your moral objections to it tend to go away. Now, what's going on here? We know that John Rolfe's first starts to ship tobacco from Jamestown to England in 1612. From 1612 to 2009, tobacco is Virginia's number one cash crop. They ate soybeans. But that's almost 400 years. 2009. 2009. Now, Spanish tobacco. English people are addicted to a drug sold by their number one enemy, right? John Rolfe gets Spanish tobacco. Why is that a big deal? Because he can cut the Spanish out of that business. Now, some people argue traditionally that John Rolfe got those Spanish tobacco seeds because some Spanish captain gave them to him. That's what I learned growing up. That doesn't make any sense to me because the Spaniard was not supposed to give those seeds to a non-Spaniard upon pain of death. The reason I think Bermuda is important is the one place I can put John Rolfe physically that I know he was where one can find those Spanish tobacco seeds. And when he finally gets to Jamestown, it seems like the timeline suggests that it's actually in Bermuda he found those seeds. But the point is in 1614, we document that he shipped 400 pounds of tobacco from here to England. By 1619, it's 25,000 pounds of tobacco. And that's what changes Jamestown from a fort to a bustling port city. That's what explodes the English population from several hundred to several thousand. That's what changes Jamestown in Virginia from a colony that's just a fort to a colony that's 90 miles long. And that is exactly why the Powhatan people are gonna feel threatened. And that's why there's gonna be a war in 1622 where we ended our last tour. And that's also why there's gonna be representative government, ladies and gentlemen, because the whole point is you can't really control this tobacco business if you got 90 miles of people doing their own thing. So they have an elected government. They have laws, they enforce contracts. All this is going on. Now, the reason I'm telling you all this backstory is because the arrival of Africans is actually documented by the same John Rolfe. The man who once married Pocahontas, the guy who introduced tobacco in Virginia, has gone from a nobody to a somebody because in 1619, he is sitting on the governor's personal council. That's quite a remarkable achievement in just five years. And the reason I tell you that is, if you were in his position, would you do anything to mess that up? Now John Rolfe is writing a letter in 1620, one you may have heard quoted before. But my job today is to provide a little context to why he said what he said. That letter was actually written in January of 1620, and John Rolfe wrote this letter basically stating what happened in the year 1619 in about eight or nine pages. He wrote a letter to his boss. Now who in the world is his boss? A guy named Sir Edwin Sands. Now Sir Edwin Sands is actually a relatively decent fellow. He is against the king. He is for the rights of parliament. He has a lot of ideas that sound like the American Revolution 180 years before they became popular. And he is the treasurer and CEO of the Virginia Company, and he hates piracy, and he doesn't want seeing English people engaging in slavery or anything like that. He is a reformed-minded individual, and you have to write a letter to your boss and relate to him things that he's not gonna wanna hear, ladies and gentlemen. Now, if you've ever had to write a letter like that or an email, where do you bury the bad news? Somewhere in the middle, somewhere at the end? See, the context of some very famous paragraphs you've heard quoted on the news is that the first, say, six pages of the letter is John Rolfe telling you everything's great at Jamestown. Look at all the money we're making off tobacco. Look at how the Virginia General Assembly was a great hit. Look at how George Jarley's doing a great job as governor. Good news, good news, good news, good news, good news, good news, good news. Dot, dot, dot. Now, two paragraphs. One you've heard quoted. I'm going to quote it verbatim and then we'll explain what it means. Heard this on the news, you may have seen it on Facebook. All right, late August, quote, late August 1619, there appeared off the coast of Old Point Comfort, a Dutch man of war. There was nothing on board her but 20 and odd Negroes that the governor and Cape Merchant bought for victuals, unquote. What in the world does he mean? Well, he's stating very clearly, and I don't know why there's a controversy today. He's stating very clearly the event of the Africans' arrival is actually in what's called Hampton, Virginia today, 25 miles to our east. That is absolutely the case. That would be where um, Fort Monroe is today. And they do an ex excellent interpretation of that event there. We are the capital where the government is meeting. Why on earth is a ship landing at Old Point Comfort? Because you do have to keep in mind, this is where we got in trouble misunderstanding our own laws here. There was a law passed that a ship 
had to check into Jamestown before it was allowed to do any business anywhere else. I agree. That ship should have landed in Jamestown, but the fact is the ship did not land at Jamestown because when you're doing something illegal, you don't check in at the capital. You hang around the coast so you can make a quick getaway. Old Point Comfort means Hampton, Virginia. Now he says nothing on board. Now when he's using the Spanish term for black with a capital N, that's a slavery thing. That is using the Spanish language. That is saying something different than what the English would use for people of color in their own country. That's very telling. 20 and odd means 20 something. So he's saying 20 something Africans. It's very clear what he says. We're bought for victuals. We're traded for food. We're purchased. There's no talk of anyone signing an indenture contract. These people are here against their will. And he's actually saying it's the fault of the Dutch people. Now, this one is interesting to me. He says it's a Dutch man of war, a Dutch Navy ship is what he says. Not our fault. The name of the ship is the White Lion, ladies and gentlemen. That ain't Dutch. Ship is actually captained by a guy called John Joke. He's from Cornwall. That's in England. The crew of the ship is English, and the ship was once owned by Sir Francis Drake. That's as English a ship as it gets. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the only real complicated part of the story, but the reason it's so complicated is the primary source we've all been quoting and debating in the news was obscured by someone trying not to get in trouble. Therefore, a lot of the information that I'm telling you by John Rolfe was being covered up. You see, if you just look at English records, it's not going to be obvious. you got to look beyond the English records and see what the Spanish are writing about. We'll get into it. But the name of the ship was the White Line, the captain, the crew, they were all English. But here's what's going on here. It is against the charter of the Virginia Company of London to engage in piracy. Absolutely was. It's against the law to engage in piracy. And the point is, if a ship does engage in piracy, well, that can get your king in trouble, your country in trouble, and your business in trouble. So there were pirates walking, uh, uh, operating out of Virginia. Okay, there's pirates being operating out of Bermuda. In fact, the guy who's actually bankrolling the pirates, and let's not even call them pirates, call them what they really were 40 years ago, gangsters. They aren't Johnny Depp. These are criminal people of this disobeying English law, and every generation of culture has them. Now, the problem is, people who are good gangsters often have political cover. And the political cover of a gangster piracy operation between Bermuda, the Bahamas, and Jamestown is being run by a guy called Sir Robert Rich. Robert Rich knows the king. Robert Rich is a lord. He's one of the most powerful people in England, and he's running Bermuda, and he's running piracy ships. Now, here's the point. You don't want to get your ships caught up in piracy, but you want to profit from piracy, there's a common trick everyone knew how to do. You get what's called a letter of market from a third party government. See, every good English pirate knew how to do this. See, the Netherlands is fighting for independence against the Spanish. So if you want to rob the Spanish, you go to the Dutch government and say, we'll rob the Spanish in your name. Okay, here's a piece of paper called a letter of market. You're good to go. It doesn't actually make you Dutch. It's a common trick. So that's the problem with the first paragraph, the one you may have heard before. There's a second paragraph, and this one's more alarming to me. It said there was a second ship that came three days later. What was the name of this ship? Treasurer. What's the problem with the treasurer? That ship was actually owned by the Virginia Company of London directly. It was the ship that famously captured Pocahontas in 1613. How are you going to explain that one away? It doesn't have a letter of market. So John Rolfe actually said in this second paragraph that he himself, John Rolfe, and his friend, William Pierce, remember that name, that Pierce and him rode down to Point Comfort to check out what the treasurer had to offer. And he said, the treasurer never landed, never showed up. There's no such thing. The treasurer never showed up. Okay, here's the problem. Sorry for sounding like a prosecutor, but we have two documents called the 1620 muster and the 1625 muster. These are essentially censuses. A lot of people who are related to Jamestown people love these census records because it's how they prove they have ancestors here. But if you actually look at the page from hint, hint, William Pierce, who lived here at Jamestown, they list in his household three European servants, one named Emily, can't even read some of it, Edmund. But it says here, first name, last name, age, and what ship they came on. Abigail, Abigail, Jonathan. Okay, this is how white servants are being written in the records. But then it says, Angela describes her as a black woman and says she arrived here on a ship called the treasurer. But I was told the treasurer never landed. And yet the treasurer had to have landed for Angela to have been purchased off the treasurer by, get this, William Pierce, one of the guys told, who told you the treasurer never landed. And why would John Rolfe be covering up for William Pierce? 
Because when Pocahontas died, John Rolfe married Jane Pierce, William Pierce's daughter. It's John Rolfe's father-in-law. So it's very complicated to unpack this. And why is it so complicated? Because the people giving you the primary sources weren't telling you the whole truth. If they get caught doing any of this, the Virginia company and the tobacco business could be put out of business. So how do we know the rest of the story? Because finally in the 1990s, people like John Thornton and Linda Haywood actually started looking at Spanish records. If you talk to Latin American historians, they'd be like, oh, we've known about the story of the San Juan Batista for years. And when you read Spanish, you're going to say there was a Spanish slave ship called San Juan Batista. It left Luanda, Angola in 1619 with 350 Africans. They took a known Spanish route to sell people first in Jamaica. Then they were headed to the Yucatan Peninsula eventually to Veracruz, Mexico, for one reason, to sell Africans in Veracruz who would literally be sold up the river to work in Spanish silver mines in Zacatecas. But that Spanish captain named Mendez said, when we got to the Yucatan Peninsula, our ship was attacked by two English pirate ships. He said, I heard them talking. They were English. Those ships were the white line and the treasure. When you start looking at the battle that took place, the damage the English ships had, the fact that the Spaniards said they took 60 Africans off my San Juan Batista, and the fact that 30 Africans were sold in Virginia and 30 were sold in Bermuda right after this battle took place, because they're the only two places in the English-speaking world in America at the time, it's very easy to draw the circle and realize it's actually the white lion of the treasure who attacked that Spanish ship. And if anyone admits this at Jamestown, what happens to Jamestown? Put out of business. So John Rolfe's writing this letter, and John Rolfe has become a somebody, and he used to be a nobody, and if he gets caught doing any of this, what happens to him? Therefore, the primary source was obscured, leading for 30, 40 years of historians fighting until someone figured out, let's look at the Spanish record, and the story became far more clear. And Angela's living right over there, and Angela's here against her will. And that's what people didn't want to admit for years at this part. The 1957 textbook in Virginia, which is quite notorious in our state, said that this was the Dutch people's fault. And if we are going to admit that slavery happened, well, it wasn't that bad. I mean, that's what we were taught for three generations in Virginia, and it's not like this museum wouldn't have actually agreed for many, many years. So the point is, when you start down this path, ladies and gentlemen, and you're going to keep on this path, what you're going to find is this is not the only time in our story I'm going to be telling you things that aren't necessarily going to be on the signs. But are we here just to read the signs or do we want to dig a little deeper today? What really happened in 1619? So at this point, what I want to do in about four stops, and we're going to keep to the shade and the benches, is what's the backstory of race in England? Because the condition of most Afro-British people is to be free, albeit working class. I'm not saying there's an absence of prejudice in England. But if the average African descended person living in England is a free person, then somebody had to be subverting the law at Jamestown for this to happen. Number two, we're going to talk about what happens in West Central Africa. Some people refer to the first Africans as Angolans. Technically, that's not correct. They would be from the Dongo Kingdom, which is now in Angola. Dongo people were actually taken in 1619 because of a war, where they were actually outnumbered by four countries in 1619. Then we're going to talk about the fact that a lot of people say, well, there can't be slavery mark in 1619 because the English had no laws legalizing the practice. I'm going to argue it's de facto slavery. It's like saying, well, there's no racial segregation in New York in 1950 because they didn't have the same signs they had in Alabama. That's naive. There is a de facto slavery, but I'm going to say there's a reason it takes till 1662 to pass the first laws. The English didn't think they needed them. And I'm going to do something else, too. As I said, that there's also a group of people called European indentured servants. Now, most of them are here willingly, but the point is these are people being whipped and beaten themselves. And so there's going to be something I think a lot of people miss. Several generations where indentured servants and enslaved Africans are in many cases running away together and allies with one another. So the order for this antebellum system we're familiar with to get established by the time of Williamsburg, one piece of the puzzle that's often missed is someone's going to have to find a way to separate these indentured servants and enslaved Africans. And that legacy, ladies and gentlemen, is still very much with us today. And it was born here in this field. So we're going to talk about that because in many ways the admission that this is actually how it still is and this is where it comes from is important because until four years ago there was no tour like this there was no archaeological dig about this even as early as 1916 african-american scholars wanted a monument put up for the first africans r parker officially said that story is not important and said it was the dutch people's fault well this is where we are now it's only been since four years ago 
So again, we're going to do a few stops. What's race like in England 400 years ago? This might be surprising in some ways. What's going on in West Central Africa? So we're going to cover several continents. And then at the end, we're going to put it all together to see how custom turned into law. But don't think everybody agreed with it. There were people who fought back, resisted, and tried to say no. Just because we know the end of the story, we should figure out how it all actually got put together. Because it's very telling today. We had the same exact story Bermuda had in 1619, but we have a different result than Bermuda today. That's why it's important to go beyond just 1619 to what happened in generation two or three of Jamestown. And I'm gonna take you to a street that has more 17th century African-American history than any other place in the country. Barely mentioned on any sign, but I'm gonna point out some very important places. So follow me. Like I said, the first part's the most complicated because uh, we're covering things that were covered up in the records. And again, we had to go to other languages and countries to really unpack some of this. And this was, a lot of this was done over 30 years ago, but it got the ball rolling. Traditionally, before the 1990s, People presumed the first Africans had been taken from Latin America directly, like they had already been in, say, Cuba or Dominican Republic. But uncovering the story of the San Juan Batista and the timeline of the arrival of those two ships in uh, Virginia really changed everything and allowed for further research in places like Angola, England, uh, and in Mexico. So again, that was a work of many historians that came before me, but this is kind of a summary of that, but you have to keep in mind how difficult it is. And if you don't know some of the, the, the obscurities or what was being obscured, you can see how that leads to different debates and arguments. And sometimes you just can't take that primary source at face value you have to uncover why someone writing what they're writing. But what I want to do right now, I think at this point, will be a little more straightforward. And as I say, to look at the concepts. And I don't have all the answers. I'm just going to say that I'm looking for evidence of when is the modern concept that we know of race and color kind of being developed. And really, my, many scholars will tell you somewhere between the 15 and 1600s. At the time period, you see of European colonization, but also the rise of transatlantic slave trade in West and West Central Africa. But I want to go back to a time in England uh, before this has happened. I think it's very important to look sometimes at popular culture. Pop culture tells you a lot about how average folks feel, not just the elite. So I want to show you a picture of a fictional character, a very important fictional character. His name is Sir Morian. Sir Morian is actually one of King Arthur's Knights of the Round Table. The reason that's important is it doesn't get more equal than being a Knight of the Round Table. There were 76 characters called the Knights of the Round Table. Three were men of color. This particular individual, Sir Morian, his name is supposed to give it away. Sir Morian the Moor. Now, Moor can mean different things at different time periods. I get it. You could be an Arab Moor, a Berber Moor. Uh, but in this case, he's not uh, seen as a Muslim. They actually make the point he's a Christian. So they're meaning more in the sense of being a black man. And I've seen the translation of the Morian story. Uh, essentially, he's Sir Lancelot's friend. He is an African knight. He's a Christian. He helps rescue Lancelot. His story fell out of favor after 1550, but you may be familiar with the basics of the story because it's blended into recent Robin Hood movies. That's actually the Morian story. What's cool about the Morian story, though, even though it's a little awkward, because essentially what it says is, okay, Morian's this great knight. He's a black man. Norian did this great thing and they keep saying, by the way, he's a black man. I mean, they keep emphasizing basically this is the gist of the story. Look how he's like us, look how he's different, but look how he's like us, look how he's different. So it would seem very awkward today to read that story. But the point is, you got European children looking up to him. That's the real point. He's an African born superhero. Aren't these the superheroes of 700 years ago? And the reason why this is interesting is that uh, I think it's the Atlanta Black Star newspaper did a cool expose on Sir Morian, I think in 2017, for a very good reason. They were responding to the success of the film Black Panther and posing the question, where have we seen in the Western world an African-born superhero like this before? And they said, well, remember Sir Morian. What's kind of neat about Sir Morian is that even though he fell out of favor after 1550, and I'm going to explain later why that is, and he wasn't popular anymore, um, the most recent King Arthur movie put Sir Morian back. So Sir Morian is now back in the uh, films of King Arthur, or the stories of King Arthur. But there is literally a blanking out of Morian. Okay, this is not the only person this happens to. It's just one snippet. We also see this with church figures. Uh, and I want to hold up a picture of a guy known as St. Maurice. Now, this is not an English uh, story. This is a German story. But St. Maurice was, a, was described as a black man who was an Egyptian Roman general who refused to kill other Christians and was martyred, I think, in Switzerland. Point is, if you go to Switzerland, Austria, and Germany, you will see paintings and you will see sculptures of St. Maurice. Lots of places named for St. Maurice, the Order of St. Maurice, right? You may have seen images in, in Europe and you say, who is that? That's St. Maurice. St. Maurice 
is giving advice to the Pope. This is not a subservient fellow at all. The point is he's the patron saint of the German-speaking Holy Roman Empire. Now, we don't know what the real St. Maurice looked like. The point is, for over 600 years, he was always depicted as a black man. And then somehow after 1550, what happens to pictures of St. Maurice? He turns into a blonde-haired white man just like that. Now, this keeps happening around 1550. St. Veronica is another saint, but there's others. But uh, you will see the change in the art. And I'm saying it's not really an accident. Uh, before 1550, right, this is the depiction of Europeans paying homage to the richest man in the world who lived in the Mali Kingdom. There you go. Yeah, sorry, I forgot his name. But yes, absolutely. And the point is, this is common. This is not weird. This is normal for Europeans to depict Africans in such a manner. Even people we know who are working class. John Blank, trumpeter for King Henry VIII, appears on three different tapestries on the Westminster Tournament Roll. Point is, he is a trumpeter for King Henry VIII. In fact, he asked King Henry VIII for a raise. That's the scariest person in English history to ask a raise from. And he gets it. Point is, he's well-respected, well-liked. Working class guy, not saying he didn't face discrimination, I'm just saying he's a citizen. And it's not just like random people. Uh, one of the things I did during the pandemic is I started looking at church parish records in London, and I found at least 27 baptisms at St. Uh, Baltas Parish, which is in Aldgate, so it's the old city walls of London. There are at least 27 uh, men and women of color First name, last name, age, occupation, Christian stats. All signs of citizenship on the records. The exact opposite of what we see on this record with Angela. Now, why 1550, right? Portuguese were getting involved in the transatlantic slave trade as early as 1480. I get that. But 1550 is a good year to circle. This is a major sea change because this is when Portugal gains control over Brazil and the transatlantic slave trade completely explodes. Just the number of African people in Europe explodes. So Seville, uh, Spain, and uh, Lisbon, Portugal were about 10% black by 1600. London, perhaps 2%. This is, again, we're not sure the records exactly, but this is an estimation. Now the point is, there's a growing field of Afro-British history. Uh, black History Month in the UK, I think is October. And the gist of it is, look, we didn't just all get here on the wind rush in 1948. The point is, People of color lived in England. Yes, small in number, but the point is significant, significant to be citizens. Now, the point is the African population or African born population of England itself is growing after 1550, de facto because of the transatlantic slave trade. Even though the English are not supposed to be engaged in it, it's happening anyway with privateers and pirates like Hawkins and Drake and others, people who are raiding Panama City or Santo Domingo or Havana, right? So in some cases, are there black men and women going willingly with the English? Yeah, if they hate the Spanish. But in some cases, like in Panama, people of color are defending the Spanish against the English. And the English are surprised at this. And in other cases, he's taking people. There's a, a story you may have heard where some of the Africans were just dumped off the beaches of South Carolina, at least 200 men and women. We don't know their fate, but some have argued intermarried within the local Native American population. And I think this is most likely the case. The point is, all this happens way before Jamestown. But how does it change England? To me, it changes England because there is a growing African population of London, particularly on the south bank of the River Thames in the Southwark neighborhood. Now, this to me is very important because you start to notice something. If you want to know what's going on, watch for people complaining. There's a very, very important person in England complaining about the African population of London. Her name is Queen Elizabeth I. She writes an order to the Lord Mayor of London. She says, there's far too many black and Moors in my room. She actually hires a Dutch naval captain to try to deport this population. The guy comes back to her and says, um, nobody help me. It's a pretty good thing when you think about it. What that's saying is, somebody in the royal family has a problem. What about poor people in London? London's a port city, ladies and gentlemen. Port cities are always international places. In other words, the working class people in London doesn't, doesn't, they don't care. Well, that's just my neighbor, John. Well, that's the guy I work with, Frank. See what I'm getting at? Because I say this for a reason, five years later, she gives another order. This time, she actually writes it differently. To my liege subject, she means to the poor people of London, help me deport this population. You want to know why? They're taking your jobs. They convince her to shelve the order. It was so embarrassing. So what we're seeing now is by 1550, elite attitudes towards people of color are definitely changing in Europe. 
but the working class haven't necessarily bought in yet. And that's important because this may play out at Jamestown's much more. I mean, the planters might view Angela one way, correct? What about indentured servants? Maybe a little different if they're working in the same fields. Therefore, the separation hasn't quite happened in London yet, and it hasn't happened in Virginia yet. But that's very important because there's a reason why things are gonna happen the way they play out. You actually see this affect pop culture. This will be our last point before we move on. It actually affects pop culture. See, if you look for elite pop culture, uh, like uh, you're gonna see some very racist plays and they seem to be popping up around the time of Jamestown. In one particular play in 1605 that's rather notorious, because it's actually commissioned by the Queen of England, Queen Anne, who's James's wife, called A Mask of Blackness. A Mask of Blackness is not written by some hack. It's written by Ben Johnson, staged by Nico Jones. I mean, this is like the cream of the crop of the literati. Essentially, the play, you can look it up yourself. It's rather embarrassing, frankly, to talk about. It's a blackface play. The whole point is the plot is these maids of Ethiopia can only become fair if they actually turn white by going to England with the light of King James. It's a very bizarre kind of play. The Queen of England actually played one of the princesses. But the point is, it's rather typical of what's happening, and it's a very uh, negative, stereotypical uh, connection with blackness and things that are bad. It's racist, is what we're saying. And it was actually staged in front of board members of the Virginia Company of London, people who actually paid for people to come to Jamestown. Now, does everybody agree with this play? Well, I will say that in 1604, there's another play written. Frankly, it's written by a better playwright. And it's this play, a famous play called Othello. Now, let's not let Shakespeare completely off the hook. If you read Titus Andronicus 20 years earlier, it's a rather negative depiction of Aaron the Moor. Something's interesting about Shakespeare in 1604. When he writes Othello, the original source material for Othello is an Italian play. And Othello is actually a minor character in that version. But in the English version, he is the protagonist. Othello is a wise man. He's a general. He liberates the Italian people. He's a good man. He's a kind man. Shakespeare makes it clear. Who are the bad guys? Act one, scene one. Go back and read it. Iago and Rodrigo. And they're bad guys because they're racist. It, it depicts them as negative. And I find this very fascinating because Shakespeare's going back to picking a man of color the way it would have been typical before the 1550s. But the whole point of the play is he's brought down literally by racism. Falls in love with a white woman, they plot against him. Now, if everyone in England is racist, ladies and gentlemen, in 1604, this play makes no sense. But honestly, if no one in England is racist, this play makes no sense. This play only makes sense if they're having some sort of conversation similar to conversations we're still having. In other words, Shakespeare's writing this play, yeah? And where is the Globe Theater at? Southwark. And what neighborhood is Southwark? The area of London where most of the people of color live, including Josephine, who ran the tavern across the street from Shakespeare's theater. So where did Shakespeare go to get a beer from? Who did he know? Who did he see? Why is his uh, idea more realistic than the Ben Johnson's? See, it kind of shows you but not everyone agrees to this. And I think this is important because if we're looking for this where the disease of racial hatred is sort of beginning, not everybody agreed with it. I think that's always important to bring up that if not everyone agrees with it, that means that we're not sort of fated to always have to have horrible opinions. We need to understand that people did fight back. They didn't necessarily win, but it's worth pointing out that not everyone agreed. And that's true of Jamestown. Now, that's not to say that indentured servants and enslaved Africans are seen as the same, because there's a big fundamental difference between willingly coming here and not willingly coming here. Now, I will admit to you, some indentured servants, if they're children or debtors or prisoners, are being brought here against their will. But for the most part, people are signing these contracts to five to seven years. They're willingly coming here, English servants or European servants. But in practice, ladies and gentlemen, here's the thing. Uh, these European servants often were bit, beaten, raped, whipped. We see this because you can look at the legal cases. They're charging their masters with these things. Here at Jamestown, what would this mean? You have a lot of poor people here. This fort is expanding right where we're sitting into a town. This town had lots of docks and warehouses. The crime rate was very high. You look at the court cases. This is not a safe neighborhood. This is a dangerous neighborhood. This town had 2,000 people in nine taverns, ladies and gentlemen. This is a wild town. Very poor people lived here and very rich people lived here. Where did the rich people live? On the other side of Jamestown, where the hill is. There's two streets here. This is the poor street, the rich streets, and right behind it. 
middle class people or small farmers, they live outside of Jamestown. They remind one of Charleston and New Orleans, juxtaposition of rich and poor, the middle lives somewhere else. Port cities tend to be this way. So Angela, I'm gonna show you where she first walked the ground here in Virginia. We'll find out her There's so two candidates. There are lots of docks here. Uh, can number one would be kind of where we're sitting. The main uh, public dock at Jamestown would have gone way out to the water here. Potentially could have been where Angela uh, was first stepping foot. The other candidate would just be a few yards down the path here because William Pierce owned all the property from where the uh, brick ruin is all the way to the river. So that would be another candidate. He had his own personal dock. But it's this street where Angela first steps foot in Virginia. Purchase uh, at Old Point Comfort may have never left the ship though there. Taken, put here, uh, working for William Pierce. We'll show you where in just a minute or two. But if you're Angela, you are an enslaved woman. Uh, most likely, looking at Spanish records, I put her at age 14 to 22, most likely young. Uh, in this particular case, she's one of nine Africans living in this town. This town's not safe for anyone, but if you were a teenage enslaved African woman, this place is beyond frightening. But you already had a harrowing journey to be here. You know how many people tell me what a beautiful view this is? If you're Angela, you're looking over here, this is not a beautiful view. This is a prison. This is something you're forced to be at. Your home is across the ocean. You're not going to see it again. This is a different reality than someone who's willingly coming here. And yet it's hard for anyone to come here. The death rate at Jamestown tended to be 80% of people died within two years of living, of living here, of arriving here. But Angela's journey does not begin in Virginia, it began in the Dongo Kingdom, which is now in the modern country of Angola. So the Dongo Kingdom uh, was a very powerful state. There are two major players in West Central Africa. Dongo's here, right here, in modern day Angola. But to the north is the Congo Kingdom, which is still the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Now the Congo Kingdom was the biggest player in West Central Africa. This is a country that became powerful by swallowing up smaller states. This is how France became France, and China became China, and Japan became Japan. So the point is the Congo Kingdom is the most powerful West Central African state. Dongo broke away from them. Dongo are rivals of Congo. Now this is important to our story for this reason. When the Portuguese, being the first European country to kind of uh, step foot in West Central Africa, uh, we kind of have this idea of European colonialism in Africa based on the 19th century. You know, the big helmets and the red jackets, that, that's far away. You don't have any European countries that are going to be powerful enough to kick down the door and make demands. That's not happening. See, Portugal goes nowhere until they have a relationship with the Congo Kingdom. And they do. Now, this is always controversial because people ask me, well, didn't certain people enslave other people? Well, yes. For most of human history, you're going to find that people enslave people who look just like them in many ways. But again, we're presuming a brotherhood and sisterhood that did not exist yet. In other words, um, if people from Congo sold people from Dongo who they captured, uh, to me it's no more unusual than the fact that the, the English people were very brutal to the Irish people whose DNA is almost identical to the English people. The point is, in many cases, people were sold uh, who were captured from other countries. And so this is all going to happen very small at first because the Portuguese can't really take people without brokering from the Congo Kingdom, who they have a 30-year relationship with. But then by the 1550s, something happens. This is what I want to get to the 1550s for. By the 1550s, something happens. I'm going to say yet again, when Portugal gains control over Brazil, what do they think about their reciprocal relationship with the uh, Congo Kingdom? Not good enough. Don't want to go through the Congo Kingdom they are wanting to take people directly themselves. And they go so far as to start their own Portuguese colony and they carve it out of the Dongo Kingdom using a Dongo term for chief or leader and they call it Angola or Angola. That's why I don't call Angela Angola. That'd be like calling a Powhatan person a Jamestown, Virginia. The Dongo people are having their land carved out and the Portuguese create a fort just like this one and they named the place Luanda. Now Luanda is still the capital of Angola. Actually Luanda is one of the richest cities in the world. If you go to Luanda today, it looks like South Beach. It's got casinos, hotels, restaurants, BMWs, Mercedes. There's a lot of wealth in Africa. Now, it's almost all concentrated in former colonial capitals. So if you leave Luanda, you're gonna see a lot of poverty outside of Luanda, but a lot of wealth in Luanda because of the oil and gas business. Before, years ago, Luanda made its money being a major slave trading port. And so there are going to be Africans involved, uh, Spaniards, uh, Portuguese people, Arabs, lots of people are involved in this 
brutal, ugly business that lasted for 350 years. We're talking 19 million people taken from the continent all over the world in a 350 year period. That's UNESCO statistics. But in our particular story, what's happening in West Central Africa is that the Portuguese have a literally trafficking, human trafficking state called Angola and another one to the Indian Ocean called Mozambique. These both remain Portuguese colonies until 1974. You ask the people of Angola when slavery ended, you know what they tell you? 1974. Now the problem with the Dongo Kingdom is the Dongo Kingdom is trying to resist the Portuguese, right? But they're in the middle of Mozambique and Angola. So an ambitious governor also named Mendes Vasconcelos has the idea that he wants to unite Mozambique with Angola. Now who's in the middle? Who's in the way? The Dongo Kingdom. And so what happens, I said several countries combine to attack the Dongo Kingdom in 1619, they would be Portuguese soldiers, some Spanish soldiers, uh, Congo soldiers, the enemy of Dongo, and Mbangalas. These are stateless mercenaries from the highlands of West Central Africa who everyone feared. And in many cases, it's the Mbangala doing most of the fighting. And the reason this matters is the city of Kabasa, which once was the size of London, was absolutely ransacked and destroyed in 1619 a few weeks, uh, a few months before the first uh, General Assembly of Virginia. This is what's going on in modern day Angola. Now, there were so many people captured in this war, they were forced to march 200 miles to get to Luanda. According to several priests, there were so many people taken that they were on the beaches rather than the slave pens. Now, this is important. There's a guy called Alonso Sandoval. He's a Spanish guy. He's actually saying something that really awful is happening. He's saying, well, all these people, they're having water thrown on them. They're being mass baptized so that the Spanish and Portuguese don't feel guilty that people are going to die in the middle patch. What we say of their soul. There are some priests calling this out saying these aren't true conversions. And because they wrote what was going on down, we actually have some records of what was happening in 1619. So there were people who were Dongo people. They aren't Christian. They're Kambudu speakers. They don't have that belief system. But all of a sudden we see in our records, these, all, these people all have Christian names, right? So how does it happen? Well, someone gets mass baptized. You're Mateo, you are Isabella, you're Maria, you're Antonio, you're Angela. Angela Jamestown's name can't really be Angela. But we'll never know her real name because it's not allowed to be said. So Angela becomes Angela because the name is the same in Spanish and English, but Antonio becomes Anthony, Isabella becomes Isabel, and Maria becomes Mary, and so forth and so on. Now the point is, how are the Spanish involved if we said this is a Portuguese colony. This is a very complicated thing, but Spain and Portugal in this 50 year window of time share the same monarchy. So even though before this time, the Spanish weren't supposed to be operating out of Africa, now that they share the same king, Spanish ships and Portuguese ships are equally operating out of Angola. That's important because the Spanish are, the English are only going to attack Spanish ships, not Portuguese ships. So the point is the San Juan Batista was a Spanish ship and there were three major routes that people took from Luanda to the New World. The Portuguese route was to go to Brazil, right? The two Spanish routes was to go to Cartagena, Colombia. The other route was to go to Jamaica and then to Mexico. The San Juan Batista took the northern route. If the Spanish know this route and the Portuguese know this route, you better believe the English pirates know this route as well. Which means it stands to reason that the people attacking the San Juan Batista absolutely knew what was on the San Juan Batista or who was on the San Juan it makes it less accidental and more deliberate once you realize the politics of what was going on. So Angela, think about her life. Her name is not really Angela, but we never know it. She speaks Kimbundu, but she's probably not allowed to speak it anymore. She's probably a teenager, or at least in her early 20s. Her country is destroyed in a war. She's forced to march 200 miles, chained head to foot, sold on the beaches of Luanda, stuffed in the hold of a slave ship, then has to survive the Middle Passage, then has to survive a pirate battle to be resold again in Virginia before she walks on this ground here. That's why she's different than an indentured servant. It doesn't mean indentured servants aren't treated horribly. It just means Angela's <laughs> whole way of getting here shows you we can't just say, well, there's no slavery yet. Sounds like it when you think about how Angela got here. So for our last stop then, how do we get from something that was de facto to something that was de jure? We'll talk about that on a stretch of land when I am certain has more history for black America in the 17th century than any other part of Virginia. And yet the signs aren't up yet. Let me show you. That's it. Still significant. We'll talk about why we're on this street though.
There's a lot within a panorama where you're standing. We hear about Angela on two pieces of paper only, ladies and gentlemen. 1620 census, 1625 census. Living in the William Pierce household. So where was the William Pierce household? That 18th century building, okay, it's not built yet, of course. I want you to kind of imagine what's past it. And I would take you there literally, but like this time of year, it is, it is tech city. So we're gonna kind of stay around here just for safety. But, but I want you to know we did digging right behind that building for about two and a half years of our three-year practice. And the reason is because we know William Pierce lived on the road right there. You see the road right there by the fence? Well, William Pierce lived on Back Street, and this is a big house built on Back Street in the 1700s, but William Pierce's building must have been right underneath there in the 1600s, because we all know we're going to build a fancy house. We want our fancy house facing the river, because that's what we do. But this was actually the ugliest street at Jamestown. That is not where you want to build your fancy house. And we got something wrong. We dug for two and a half years right over there. Couldn't find anything from the early 1600s. We didn't find anything that could be Angela's. We didn't find anything that could be from Angela's time period. I mean, it was extremely disappointing and frankly, a little embarrassing. Turns out we were digging in the wrong place. The road wasn't there in the 1600s. Now, if you watch back that direction, the road that's straight right by the obelisk is in the right place, but it curves to the right here. It curved to the right here in the 1800s or 1700s. So we used ground pinning trading radar and we found out that down that hill, right by the swamp where the tree line is, is actually where the road used to be in the early 1600s. With three months to go in our project, what did we start doing? We started doing the archeology. span We started finding the soil stains of a wooden building. We started finding artifacts from the 1620s and earlier. We found a cavalry shell from Africa and we found beads. More importantly, we found European things uh, that are being turned into African designs like a uh, tobacco pipe made into a neck. Ladies and gentlemen, we ran out of time. We were gonna try to come back maybe in two years, but you have these three-year contracts, these three cognacs, they're over. So hopefully we'll have some friends in the park for just letting us go back in perhaps 2022. We did leave markers there so we know where to go. But I think we found where Angela actually lived because William Pierce owned all the land from the swamp line all the way here to this sign in front of you. So that's one particular candidate if he had his own dock where Angela may have landed or she may have landed right there where we just were. We're not sure, but it's either one of those two places. That means Angela actually worked in the fig garden right there in front of us tended cattle right there in front of us. I mean, this is where Angela actually worked and where she lived. But after 1625, we never hear her name again. Silence. Silence. When did she die? How old was she? We found five graves out there. We weren't allowed to dig them up, but I have a feeling Angela may be one of them. Now, how we keep the story going if we need to go back and do archaeology. What I want to say that we don't hear about Angela anymore in 1625, do you know who we hear from again? William Pierce. William Pierce was not a kind man by anybody's estimation. You know, William Pierce actually had a separate plantation, which is now Newport News, Virginia, where Fort Eustis is at Mulberry Island. We hear about him in 1639. What do we hear about him doing? Complaining to the government. Why? Because seven men ran away from him from his plantation. They hated him so much they took guns and knives and a boat to get away from the guy. They got all the way down to Norfolk and they were captured. These seven men were all whipped 30 lashes apiece. Three of the men had the letter R branded into their cheek for runaway. Several of them had a ball and chain put on their leg to do work for at least a year with a ball and chain. Wow. Now the thing about it is you're picturing these men right now. Six of them are European, one is African. All men helping each other run away, escape. If that was an isolated incident, I would rarely bring it up. The fact is, the same year in 1639, we have the John Punch case. If you watch the documentary called 13th, he's on that documentary. John Punch was from Yorktown. He was an enslaved man who ran away. He ran away, but he ran away with a Scottish man and a German man. They are indentured servants. The three men are trying to get to Maryland. They're caught trying to cross the Potomac River. Each man is whipped 30 lashes apiece. So already we see in 1639 some brotherhood, right? Between indentured servants and enslaved Africans because they hate the same people and they're being beaten by the same people. Now, then there's the inequality. And that's the whole point of the documentary. The second half of the sentencing is the two Europeans are given one extra year to serve in their contract. John Punch is sentenced to lifelong servitude. 
we have no record of any European ever given that symptom. So there's a similarity and there's a difference. And why would there be both a similarity and a difference? It seems like a paradox because there's an absence of laws, ladies and gentlemen. See, we have this uh, plaque in our museum or in our church. You may have seen a plaque that's dedicated to the common law, which began in Virginia in 1607. Well, we're talking about case law here, something fundamental in the English-speaking world where you make decisions based on other judges' decisions, right? But the point is, it's not really being practiced at Jamestown in 1607 because there's no court system yet. There's no county courts, there's no counties yet in this early generation. So what happens when you don't have a court system or actual judges and lawyers here? You have another kind of law we forget about. It's called the law of custom. And in England, the law of custom met, in the absence of judges and juries and all these things, then the highest officials can make the law for the good of the colony. See, it's important to keep that in mind because technically speaking, uh, slavery would be on very shaky ground in England in the court system. But yet it's allowed to happen here at Jamestown. Why? Because of the law of custom because it's just happening and people are allowing it to happen. Because who's making the laws? Well, Governor Yardley. Governor Yardley purchased eight Africans. He's also ruling on the status of Africans. He's not a judge, he's governor. It's de facto, it's happening. But then what starts to happen is people start running away. People start challenging the system and there's no legality to it. It starts to get on shaky ground here. Now, I wanna make this point because, because in 1650, something remarkable happens in the English speaking world the monarchy is overthrown. Remember Oliver Cromwell takes over, the king is beheaded, and for 10 years, from 1650 to 1660, England has no monarchy. Now, that's not good for the Irish, and there's definitely some problems with Cromwell, but my point is, aristocracy in England is on the run, and that's important to Virginia, because his governor, called Sir William Barclay, is fired in 1650. And for 10 years, we start seeing something interesting happen. Pro-Cromwell radicals are starting to enter Virginia. And another thing starts to happen at the same time. We have counties and we have county courts and we have judges here now. And we have something else going on. We have common law lawyers showing up in Virginia. What does that mean? We have meddling attorneys. People are complaining about these meddling attorneys. What are these meddling attorneys doing? They're challenging some of the things that have been going on in Jamestown that weren't so good. And I want you to know about a case called Elizabeth Key's case. Elizabeth Key is a woman whose father is English and her mother's African and her father had to be taken to court to admit he was her father and finally he says okay I'm the father of Elizabeth Key and she will be freed when she reaches the age of 21 we'll treat her like a European servant now here's the thing he goes back to England this new master takes over and says I don't have to free Elizabeth Key because she's a black woman Elizabeth Key has a contract saying she's supposed to be freed at 21 and they're ignoring the contract she lives enslaved for another six years while holding a piece of paper saying she's not supposed to. Now, what do these meddling attorneys do? Take up her case. Well, they argue, they argue English common law, ladies and gentlemen, which apparently is not being practiced very well. What do they argue? The lawyer argues that Elizabeth Key cannot be enslaved because her father's English. According to English common law, it's very clear. The status of the father determines the status of any child. Since Elizabeth Key's fathers are free Englishmen, she's free and she's English. Number two, According to English common law, Christians will not enslave other Christians. Elizabeth Key is a baptized, professed, church-going Christian, and therefore she must be freed because she's a Christian, according to English common law. And ladies and gentlemen, Elizabeth Key has a contract, and according to English common laws, contracts are sacrosanct. Ladies and gentlemen of the, uh, gentlemen of the jury, you must free Elizabeth Key, and they do. In Northumberland County, Virginia in 1656, meaning a black woman sues a white man in court in 1656 and wins her freedom. Freedom for herself and her child. And they even uphold the appeal here at Jamestown because they have to go by English precedent and English legal precedent actually meant slavery is on shaky ground in England. Even in the 1690s, a judge, look him up, Sir John Holt, actually wrote, a man may be a villain in England, sir, but never a slave. Judge Holt. So. What's happening here, ladies and gentlemen? I said earlier, they didn't have any laws regarding slavery in Virginia until 1662, right? Because they didn't think they needed them. Now, guess what? They think they need them because Africans are freeing themselves using courts. But the monarchy comes back in 1660. You know who else comes back in 1660? Sir William Barclay. Aristocracy comes back in 1660. What are we gonna do about these meddling attorneys? Well, we have to pass some new statutory law because the only way to overturn judges' decisions is by new statutory law. That's why you're standing here because behind you, this was the legislative building right here. There is no sign saying this happened, but it's right here in this field. 
It's in this spot in 1662 where a law is passed you may have heard of. It says from this day forward, the status of the mother will now determine the status of the child. That wasn't Charleston, that was Jamestown. They moved the capital to where our Archaeology Museum is today. 1667, you know the other laws passed? It's from henceforth, baptism and conversion to Christianity will not bring people their freedom automatically. In other words, the head priest in Virginia says, the African's uh, freedom will come in the next world, not this world. That's what the Spanish and Portuguese were saying in Angola, by the way. Now, these laws are passed as a direct response to Elizabeth Key. She's going to be fine because of double jeopardy. She can't be re-enslaved. But for future people, what happens? Think about the history of the antebellum South. People enslave their own children because of this law. Now, some people ask me, what happens if the, uh, the woman is European and the man is African? That happened, too. So they passed another law saying if a woman is caught having a child with a black man, she is whipped in front of the county church, local church. I can't remember how many lashes. I think it's 30 or 40. And the child will be a servant until 30 and must leave the colony. They can't enslave the child because of the law they just passed. But the point is, people were fighting back. It looks like English people, European people, and Africans were marrying one another, living together, running away together. And now all of a sudden, this is a problem. Laws are being passed. People are fighting back. I mean, literally taking up guns and fighting back. 1662, there's a York County bread riot, meat riot, because some indentured servants were being denied meat and they took up guns and they fought. 1663, Gloucester Servants Plot. These are English guys who are gonna kill every slave owner in Virginia. And they got captured and caught and executed. There's a black led rebellion in 1681 in Richmond County, Virginia, 60 miles to our north. All we are told that happened is that they were tried on the spot. Now that means almost certainly killed immediately. And then there's an interracial rebellion, ladies and gentlemen. It's called Bacon's Rebellion. Now, Nathaniel Bacon is not exactly a heroic figure. He just hated Sir William Barclay, thought he was out of touch, and he wants to actually take over Virginia because he felt William Barclay wasn't doing enough to protect the Virginia frontier from the Susquehanna raids. He wanted to lead his own army, essentially, to kill off the Native American population, whatever they're trying. But anyway, when he gets an army together to try to overthrow the government, in July of 1676, he does something interesting. He offers indentured servants and enslaved Africans their freedom if they join his army. They're telling guys, take up a gun for yourself. So in September 1676, it's an interracial army that burns Jamestown to the ground. You see, the laws are being passed already. But something yet hasn't happened. You still have too many Europeans and Africans on the same side. So what does this legislator start to do now? Pass a series of laws over 20 years I call Jamestown's Jim Crow. 1681, if you're an African and you're enslaved, you must be enslaved for life. No one can even free you if they want to. That law has changed. 1680, the only people denied permission to own firearms or assemble are Africans. Because then you can fight back. 1691, racial intermarriage is outlawed between white and black, remains so until 1967. 1692, Africans are told they cannot own dogs, horses, cattle, property, or testify in court. Now, all the markers of being a free English person are things like the right to defend yourself, the right to run away, the right to testify in court, the right to redress the grievances, the right to own property. All these things are being denied. It's saying you can't be a citizen, you don't count. And yet in England, Judges are ruling on cases saying you can't be enslaved in England. There's still a free community of color in London, but here in Virginia they're saying, no, we're not going to be that kind of English anymore. So when people say, oh, they followed English law, no, they're actually not following English law. They're changing the law because of the tobacco business. And they're doing it directly now. One more point to point out here, the reason why I say you're standing here. Most people of Afro-American heritage in Virginia do not have a lot of Angolan DNA. That would be typical, say, of Brazil, Colombia. In Virginia, Southeast Nigeria, Igbo, Yoruba, and it has to do with this building. In 1672, the British created what's called the Royal African Company to directly engage in the slave trade, and the British focused on the Niger River Valley. Their headquarters at Jamestown is this building right here. First law passed, 1662. Angela working there, 1619. The dock she landed on right over here. Royal African Company right here. And when it says George Marable was a Virginia tradesman, well, it doesn't say what he traded in. All of this is within 100 yards of where we're standing. It doesn't end up on the signs, but it happened. 
it happen. You start uncovering things at Jamestown. You find out what really happened here on these shores and on this land here. It makes a lot of people upset. It doesn't sound like the Jamestown they wanted to hear about. My job is not to give you the Jamestown you want to hear about, but the Jamestown the evidence sets. And what I'm saying here is one more law was passed I want to remind you of. And this is important today. Jamestown cedes to Williamsburg in 1699. But I want to mention a law passed at Williamsburg that's the final separation. 1705, a law was passed saying the only way to, to actually correct an African is the physical force. You have to hit an African. It's illegal in 1705, it's illegal to hit a white servant. And then in 1720, for the first time in history, slave Africans outnumber European servants as a labor force. And that number will continue to rise as indentured servitude is phased out. Remember this when you talk about racial separation in Virginia or in the American South. Well, I will say on the one hand, where else in the United States do white and black folks share the most culture in common with cuisine, how we pray, how we sing. Muddy Waters and Johnny Cash sang the same songs, but you know, it's the record company says you're this and you're that. We see it so much in our culture, how blended it's always been. And when people take DNA deaths and find out, well, how did that happen? Well, it's called the 1600s. There was once a closeness that happened amongst the people at the bottom of Southern society. How does a system of slavery be perpetuated for 200 more years when three-fourths of white Virginians and Southerners never owned a single African-American person? Because somebody had to buy into the system that said, as long as I'm not at the bottom, I'm a part of the system. Who became the overseers? Who became the slave catchers? Who became the people enforcing the social order? wasn't the planters. In many cases, it was the descendants of people who at one time ran away with the Africans. See, the greatest trick ever pulled in the history of this part of the country was the separation. And that separation was necessary to create the system you think of when you go to Williamsburg that lasted all the way to 1865. And the residue of that is still with us. And I say that as a white Southerner, I don't think you can deny growing up where I did Southside Virginia. I went to school in Mississippi where there are bullet holes in the columns of my campus. There's a certain reality there, isn't there? So where did that reality get born? Right here in the field. If we say we want to get better. You can't deny that you're at the scene of the crime. If you say you want to get better. You can't deny the brotherhood and sisterhood that once was there. But why did it stop? How did it begin? It doesn't take a lot of people to create a lot of evil, but it was created. And this is sort of the story of how it happened. And yet it's very hard to get anyone to put a sign up to say it happened. Why is that? Thank you very Thank much you. for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see everybody.